Hello friends, welcome to this short tutorials from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. Today's topic is a continuation of uh, amyloidosis, that's part 3 of amyloidosis. In the part 1 of amyloidosis, we discussed about uh, the properties of amyloid, whereas in the part 2, we uh, discussed in detail about the pathogenesis, the classification of amyloidosis. If you are here for the first time, I would suggest you to view those videos um, before you uh, proceed further. Okay, and the links for that is uh, given below in the description. The learning outcomes for uh, today's topic are uh, we will discuss about the organs involved in amyloidosis. We will look into the morphology and the demonstration of amyloid, particularly the gross features and microscopic features. And we will discuss in detail about the properties or uh, the features of amyloid in routine and special stains. And then we will discuss the morphology of individual organs and finally we will conclude with uh, knowing the clinical features the diagnosis and prognosis of amyloidosis so let us understand what organs are involved in uh, each uh, different type of amyloidosis that is primary amyloidosis secondary amyloidosis and familial mediterranean fever okay in primary amyloidosis the organs involved are uh, the heart the gastrointestinal tract the respiratory tract the peripheral nerves skin and tongue whereas the secondary amyloidosis, um, kidney, liver, spleen are more commonly involved, uh, followed by lymph node, adrenals, and thyroid. In the cases of familial Mediterranean fever, the most important uh, feature is that the amyloidosis is uh, widespread in this particular case, where uh, the kidneys, the blood vessels, spleen, respiratory tract, and, in, and the liver are involved. Moving on to understanding the morphology of amyloidosis. Okay. On macroscopy or gross examination, the amyloid deposits may or may not be visible. If the deposits are too much, then the organ is enlarged, uh, it appears gray or waxy and firm in consistency. You can demonstrate amyloid in gross specimens. No? This is the oldest method since the time of work of so how to demonstrate amyloid in gross specimens? What you need to do is just apply Lugol's iodine on the cut surface of uh, the uh, specimen, okay? So the area containing the amyloid stains deep brown. This particular deep brown color changes into blue on application of dilute sulfuric acid. Okay, this is a very characteristic feature uh, of uh, starch, okay, and that is the reason why this particular condition is referred to as amyloidosis because we have known that amyloidosis is uh, derived from the word amylim, which means starch like. Microscopically, uh, when you do a routine stain uh, like hematoxyl and eosin stain, okay, the deposits are predominantly found extracellularly, okay, they can be seen adjacent to the basement membranes. If the deposits are more, it encroaches on the cells and they can destroy the cells. Okay, it can be seen more in the interstitial tissues. It can be perivascular or it can be seen within the vessel wall. They appear amorphous, eosinophilic, glassy, or hyaline like. Okay, so that is how the amyloid look like. It just looks like you know um, hyaline material. Okay, they are eosinophilic material, amorphous, and then glassy are highly in like what is important here is that it has to be differentiated from other similar appearing uh, tissues like collagen fibrin etc so what do you do you have to demonstrate or you have to differentiate this by doing special stains okay now, what are those special stains the most important special stain uh, used in demonstration of amyloid is congo red stain so when you stain these sections by congo red stain if you observe the stain slide under ordinary light, you know, the amyloid appears red or pink in color. Okay, so this is how amyloid appears under Congo red stain. It appears red or pink in color. If the same slide, the Congo red stained slide is observed in polarizing microscopy, the characteristic feature is there will be apple green birefringence. This is how the apple green birefringence looks like. It is the cross beta pleated sheet conformation, okay, which is the reason for this special staining property. And this is very important to confirm the presence of amyloid. So, in other words, Congo red staining and then demonstration of apple green birefringency under polarizing microscopy is diagnostic of amyloidosis. If you see these microscopic images, this one is the HND stain where it appears eosinophilic, glassy, or highly like. The second one is Congo red stain where it looks you no know, reddish color. And third one is 
The Congo red stain slide when observed under the polarizing microscopy, there is apple green birefringence. See, apart from uh, demonstration of amyloid by Congo red stain, there are uh, many other special stains which include methyl and chrysyl violet. Okay, this is these are metachromatic dyes where the amyloid stains pink in color. The next one is thioflavin T and thioflavin S. Okay, these are uh, fluorescent dyes where the amyloid exhibits fluorescence. The alcyon blue, if you stain the tissues with alcyon blue, okay, the amyloid stains blue, and this is because of the presence of glycosaminoglycans. If you remember, uh, five, around 5% 5 of amyloid is made up of substance P, and that substance P includes so this is the one. Uh, which imparts blue color when stained um, by alcyn blue. The next one is uh, periodic acid shift where uh, the amyloid stains pink. And the lastly, immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry is very important to demonstrate or to identify the type of amyloid proteins because it helps in differentiating or distinguishing AL, AA and ATTR types. So to conclude, to confirm the presence of amyloid, the Congo red staining and demonstration of birefringence by polar microscopy is the best. And to confirm the type of amyloid, immunohistochemistry is the best. Now let us see the amyloidosis of uh, individual organs. Let us understand the morphology of you know, uh, kidney in amyloidosis. This is the most common organ involved and the most serious one too. Okay, It's most commonly found in secondary amyloidosis and it accounts for around one third of cases of primary amyloidosis. Grossly, uh, the kidneys can be of normal size or it can be enlarged. In the later stages or advanced stages, the kidneys can even be shrunken or contracted and that is because of ischemia and that ischemia is um, due to narrowing of vessels when amyloidosis affects vessels. Most of the organs, the cut surface resembles the same. It is pale and waxy or translucent in appearance. Microscopically, uh, the amyloidosis can involve any part of kidney but glomerular lesions predominates. See, the amyloid appear as amorphous material in the mesangium and capillary loops. So this is how amyloidosis uh, or the deposits of amyloid looks like in the glomeruli. Okay. See, this is amorphous eosinophilic material in the mesangium. The second one is tubules and interstitium. Okay. Initially, the deposits of amyloid are seen near the basement membrane of the tubular epithelial cells. Later, they are seen in the connective tissue between them or they are seen in the interstitial tissue. So you can easily see that there is deposition of amyloid in the interstitial tissue. Can you see that these are the amorphous eosinophilic material seen in the interstitium and thirdly if it involves the vessels you know the amyloid can be deposited perivascularly or the amyloid can be deposited in the walls of the arteries or arterioles which leads to narrowing of the lumen of these particular blood vessels so this particular uh, you know microscopic image shows there is a deposition of amyloid in the walls of the arterioles so having known the morphology of kidney in amyloidosis, what are all the clinical features we can expect? Okay, so most of these cases presents with proteinuria. The proteinuria can be so severe that it manifests, it sometimes can manifest as nephrotic syndrome. The other important thing is that whenever there is increased deposition of amyloid in the glomeruli and interstitium, it, what it results is ischemia of glomeruli and atrophy of tubules. And finally, it may lead to chronic renal failure. Moving on to uh, hepatic involvement in amyloidosis. So the liver is involved in most cases of systemic amyloidosis. Grossly, they are enlarged, they are pale and waxy. On microscopic examination, initially the amyloid deposits in the space of decay. Later, it appears in between the cords of hepatocytes and that uh, appears as ribbon-like pink staining in between the cords of hepatocytes. So this is how uh, it appears. So if you uh, if you see carefully that these are the cords of hepatocytes, these are the cords of hepatocytes, and this is a light staining or uh, lightly uh, eosinophilic staining amyloid in between these hepatic cords. If the deposition continues, it results in compression of cords later leading to shrunken or atrophic hepatocytes. So what we need to understand here is that even though you have uh, so much of amyloid deposits in the liver, clinically functional impairment of liver is extremely rare. Coming to the morphology of spleen in amyloidosis, grossly uh, for some unknown reasons there are two different patterns of amyloidosis of spleen. The first pattern is diffuse involvement or it is also referred to as lardaceous spleen. The second one is nodular uh, pattern or it is also referred to as sago spleen. 
Uh, what happens in uh, diffuse pattern is that the amyloid deposits start in the walls of splenic sinuses, which progresses till they form large diffuse masses. Grossly, there is moderate to marked enlargement of the spleen. On cut surface, these large diffuse masses, you know, they appear as map-like areas resembling lard. You know that lard is made up of the fat of pigs. This is how the lard looks like. So the map-like areas in the spleen looks like this. That is the reason why the diffuse involvement of uh, spleen is referred to as lardaceous spleen. The second one is nodular or sago spleen where microscopically, you know, the amyloid starts involving the periarticular lymphoid sheath or the white pulp. So instead of forming the diffuse uh, masses, you know, they form discrete deposits in the white pulp. And that is the reason why, you know, there is no marked enlargement, only moderate or mild enlargement of liver is seen, cut surface, translucent and waxy nodules, okay, resembling sago grains. So that's how the sago grains look. So the cut surface of the nodular involvement resembles that of, you know, the nodules resembling sago grains and that's the reason why it is also referred to as sago spleen. So remember, splenic amyloidosis is two patterns. One is diffuse form two is nodular form diffuse form is more common it is called laudaceous spleen whereas nodular form is less common it is referred to as sago spleen based on the gross appearance of these so moving on to uh, understanding the amyloidosis of heart it's commonly associated with systemic amyloidosis rarely as a localized type for example senile cardiac amyloidosis grossly the heart may be enlarged again the cut surface is pale translucent and waxy uh, the amyloid can be seen as nodules or plaques it can be seen in the epicardium or in the endocardium microscopically um, they can be seen in the coronary vessels within the vessels or surrounding these vessels they can be seen around the myocardial fibers then they are referred to as ring fibers in cases of senile cardiac amyloidosis the deposits are seen in the left atrium or in the interatrial septum so the clinical features of uh, involvement of heart includes it can uh, result in cardiac failure or the most important one is if the deposits are in the subendocardial region it can interfere with the conducting system then that can lead to uh, you know arrhythmias having uh, known the clinical features of amyloidosis now how do you diagnose amyloidosis so what we need to know that despite strong suspicion, the diagnosis of systemic amyloidosis has to be confirmed by tissue diagnosis or histopathological examination. Of course, uh, it holds true for localized amyloidosis as well. The most preferred method as of now is abdominal fat pad aspiration or biopsy. So what they do is that they aspirate uh, fat by means of fine needle aspiration or they take a biopsy and then they smear or do sections and then stain to look for amyloidosis. If they find any eosinophilic deposits, then it is confirmed by congruent staining and polarized microscopy for demonstration of apple gain by diffringence. Why abdominal fat is the most preferred? Because of simplicity, the low cost, less complications and reasonably good accuracy. Previously, rectal and gingival biopsy or labeled salivary gland biopsies were done. Whereas in the case of localized amyloidosis, all you have to do is biopsy of involved tissue and confirmation by straining. For example, in the cases of amyloidosis of heart, you have to do a subendocardial biopsy. See, knowing whether it is amyloidosis or not is just not sufficient for treatment. You have to know the type of amyloid and for that, immunohistochemistry is currently the standard method for typing in routine practice where you can confirm whether the amyloid is AL or AA type or ATTR type, etc. So prognosis, generalized or systemic amyloidosis, the prognosis is poor and particularly if it is myeloma associated amyloidosis, it has the poorer outcome. Localized amyloidosis, again, you know that the treatment is local excision or laser removal, but then a recurrence is very much common if it is improperly or incompletely removed. So guys, in this final part, we discussed about the organs involved in amyloidosis, we discussed about the morphology, and then we looked into how amyloid can be demonstrated, and then we discussed, you know, the morphology of individual organs finally studied about the clinical features the diagnosis and the prognosis of amyloidosis thank you for watching if you like this video please hit the like button do comment do subscribe this channel you know you will be updated with more and more videos to come do share thank you